Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. I'm also an elected delegate for Bernie Sanders, CD14, position four, meaning I didn't go to Philly. I uh, was replaced by a Clinton person. Um, so at any rate, I wanted to speak to you tonight about General John Allen's astonishing performance at the uh, Democratic uh, Convention, which my father called me about very excitedly. Um, he seemed to be quite proud of him. And this is a problem I've had with my father, who uh, is an Oregon boy who went off to Harvard, uh, was radicalized for a while, seeing all the rich kids there uh, and studied German history and Hegel and Marx, but now has become quite centrist in his old age. Uh, and um, so I don't know what's going on with that. I'm going to have to call him about this because when I saw this John Allen sp speech, my jaw definitely dropped and it was a fine speech, but it was a speech that could have been played at Triumph of the Will in 1934. And I will explain why before you get annoyed at me for making such a point. And that is partly a compliment in that uh, it was extremely emotionally powerful and effective. What I saw, though, was an, uh, a, a description, a classical description of American exceptionalism, which is really uh, associated in a large extent to uh, an alliance with the neocons uh, who have gotten us into these wars overseas that have cost millions of lives, trillions of dollars, are criminal enterprises, and the friends of the Bushes made hundreds of millions and billions of dollars contracting. So on top of it, Everyone suffered, millions and trillions, millions killed, trillions lost. Yet somehow the friends of the Bush has actually made hundreds of millions of dollars on this. And that money should be stripped from them. Uh, but at any rate, we saw in this orgy of American exceptionalism, every grave contour profoundly engraved into it. Meaning these were deep lines carved into granite of prejudice and uh, imperiousness, which I will describe. At one point he said that we and the American military together, uh, and one would presumably say can run the world, but what he said is to be a shining example of liberty. But what it felt like he was saying, uh, because I was following him emotionally all the way along, um, you know, playing the fantasy with him that we were absolutely right in our uh, uh, and that we vanquished evil and destroyed the forces opposed to civilization and the world order, a phrase that would get conspiracy theorists and Alex Jones uh, pretty excited about. He made it clear that it was the entire military industrial complex that was coming out to support Clinton. He stressed her ability to use multiple powers of statecraft, which sounded like she would have a rack of medieval torture uh, instruments that she could use on opponents, uh, uh, you know, various black bag intelligence operations, classical military operations with NATO, without NATO, with UN, without UN, through a proxy army, through a third party country with untraceable weapons to a proxy army. Uh, so, uh, yes, there are many instruments of torture through uh, USAID, uh, where we uh, bring about a stronger alignment into the Western sphere of influence in countries that are uh, aligning towards our potential opponents. And the world is splitting between uh, the West, uh, backed by its mega corporations, whether it's Texaco or Unilever. Uh, everywhere that these country companies flourish is the West. Uh, and um, it has its outlying sections like Russia, uh, and China, where we trade with them, but these areas are separate power centers. Uh, we do not have world hegemony yet. Uh, I mean, we are the global hegemon, uh, but uh, there are regional uh, powers still, China, uh, Russia, uh, and then the question is what's gonna happen with the other regional superpowers, which are gonna be essentially Southeast Asia, Indonesia, we can count it as one big milieu and then we've got india we've got turkey we've got uh south africa brazil 
uh, Mexico. These are the powerhouse economies, and some of them are going to line up with us, some of them are going to be partially neutral, and some of them are going to be in this uh, non-aligned group that would rather not see U.S. military bases expand further. We would rather see them contract. Uh, that would be their common denominator. The Russians, Chinese would be perfectly happy if the U.S. shut a few military bases down. And so you could basically pose that question. Do you, are you happy when you see a military base from uh, U.S. NATO light up in your neighborhood, or are you sad? And that tells you how the world will line up. And Africa's in play. South America is uh, likely to be wishing to not have more U.S. military bases as a people. But with the U.S., what we've allowed to happen is we've allowed the ruling class to run our politics. And this ruling class, which is connected to big business, is in touch with the ruling classes of the other countries. So this is nothing new. This has happened from time immemorial. Uh, and so it's a network of ruling classes uh, interacting with each other. And it, it doesn't meet the people's interests. Uh, so we end up putting in power, uh, you know, fascists like Pinochet, uh, or uh, having our industrialists help uh, a guy in Spain, Francisco Franco, uh, before Hitler helped him. Uh, we ally with conservatives because we allow this type of uh, people to dominate our political life and get into control of the State Department and the War Department. <clears throat> So Hillary has this rack of tools for probing and poking our adversaries and opponents. Um, this game of uh, risk aspect of American geopolitical domination, uh, which has happened to many American leaders, is most embodied by Henry Kissinger, who probably you could say was involved in killing more people than any man since Stalin, Hitler, and Mao. Um, You've got Vietnam, I think it was like 6 million people there. Uh, it's mainly in Southeast Asia and Indonesia. You've, you got more than 10 million people dead just in that area alone. Plus, he, uh, he supported the destabilization of governments where thousands and tens of thousands were killed in Africa and South America. Um, but somehow or another, uh, these didn't involve the mass execution of uh, huge amounts of population. For example, the U.S. military never bombed South America in a mass conventional war. And um, so the, this Kissinger is in line with uh, Mr. Allen and Mrs. Uh, Clinton. He borrowed a line from George C. Scott's Patton when he talked about us having the finest food, the best equipment, the best spirit in the world. This comes straight out of Patton's speech. And uh, I don't mind his lifting it in the way he did. I think it uh, is a, a shout out, a, uh, a nod to really uh, invoking the spirit of Patton. And Patton's spirit as a military commander is commendable. But George Allen has not embodied that. He hasn't been given the opportunity nor shown those sorts of abilities. Uh, so he can certainly emulate Patton, but he hasn't demonstrated that he is a person to take that role. Uh, and uh, then there's the, uh, the, the aspect of his patent of uh, being a strong uh, speaker and uh, motivating the troops. And I'd say that certainly General John Allen did that, although he also made it loud and clear to lots of people that were not in this party. Uh, the Bernie Sanders progressives saw nothing that they liked in that entire speech. And you'll notice as the crowd USA's would die down, the Bernie Sanders supporters would say, no more wars, no more wars. Maybe you heard that. So one might want to emulate his military achievements and his oration skills, um, but you might not want to imitate his political life because his political life was one of, uh, at the end, being perceived as being sympathetic to the Nazis uh, for allowing them to reform their society. Um, and this is a complicated matter, but he did get in hot water about this. It was obviously a very sensitive subject. And in fact, we did smuggle lots and lots of Nazis out through Operation Paperclip. Um, but uh, this wasn't to be spoken of publicly. And uh, Patton also wanted to roll all the way to Moscow, which clearly John Allen has the attitude of, which is 
it sounds to me like they're playing for uh, for to win. They're playing to win, and it's not a win-win game. It's a largely a win and capitulate game. Um, and Obama, like Roosevelt and Eisenhower, realized the horrors this would inflict to go into full-scale uh, uh, attempt to take, strip the, for example, strip the Soviet Union of all its former territories, completely isolate it, get it down to just Russia, pull all the former Soviet republics out of its orbit and incorporate them into the global uh, Western alignment. And they've been largely successful at this. And obviously Russia isn't happy with this to have all of its former territory uh, pulled away and not just uh, territorially, but also now in terms of its alliances, this territory that they allowed to become neutral is now turning hostile, basing foreign armies on its shore, uh, 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 in its territory, such as Poland and Romania hosting anti-missile systems that threaten Russia's very existence whereas previously they held Russian missile systems on them. Of course, no Russian planner would like to change the scenario uh, to go from having your missiles in Romania to having the NATO's missiles pointed at you from Romania. He describes an America that stands unswervingly on the side of liberty, with the millions of dead and displaced from American military decisions that could have been settled in diplomacy in many cases rather than through the battlefield of their adversaries, where it's mainly the innocent that get killed. Surely if a general is going to insert himself into, uh, insert the military establishment so overtly in the political scene, he should have some awareness of the incredible culpability we have for all of these ham-fisted interventions and being a primary or a secondary irritant that destabilized and wiped societies out, leading to their virtual rape, uh, as you would rape a, 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 a young person in your family was raped. So it is when your country is ravaged by war, it produces a national level of rape. America has been, for most of its history, the host of many aggressive expansionist politicians. Back to Aaron Burr. Some could be seen as relatively benign, such as Jefferson's acquiring the Louisiana Territory or the purchase of Alaska by Seward. But the theft of Spanish colonies in the provoked Spanish-American War, the theft of territory from Mexico uh, in uh, you know, glorious classical imperialism terms, you could be rooting for us to defeat them if it's all just a game of armies and conquerors. Uh, but certainly the Spanish-American War was one of a real... Uh, clear theft uh, that was beyond the early stages of solidifying the uh, manifest destiny, destiny of a coast-to-coast -coast nation that we so brazenly uh, declared. When the U.S. seized the Philippines and Puerto Rico and uh, ejected the Spanish from Cuba, leaving Cuba under the thumbs of a cruel paternalistic management from the U.S., and this was to be the case for most of Latin America, for most of its history, to side with U.S. business interests who supported the most concerned reactionary forces oftentimes in these countries, as we ally with the reactionaries, because it's our business people who have the voice, the ear of government, and uh, so their networks of business people tend to come from old money, old families worldwide that are interlocked, and their interests are maintained by this whole system, the central banking systems, uh, the election systems. The entire DNC had turned into a patronage system that was run uh, by uh, the, uh, uh, the Obama-Clinton coalition. It was not a... Uh, citizens party it was a party run by the people who had taken power <clears throat> during the cold war the american political elite saw that democracy could be quite dangerous in foreign countries it could elect people our ruling classes uh, and our meritocracy as it's evolved uh, might oppose we opposed the free elections in iran in 53 with mossadegh in guatemala with our bens in chile with allende in Argentina and Brazil and Vietnam and the Congo, the list goes on and on. Seven attempted assassinations of Castro. 
at least Bernie Sanders has brought some of these things up, uh, specifically the case of Salvador Allende's overthrow by Pinochet with the help of Kissinger and Nixon in 1973. This did not hurt him with the Latino community to bring these things up. Sadly, under Clinton Obama, progressive forces in Latin America have been treated badly and rolled back. Argentina has lost their progressive government. Brazil, through extra constitutional means, nearly had their pro-worker government forced out and replaced by right-wing, uh, 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 wealthy, uh, established interests in Brazil. The U.S. is bristling with military bases from Guatemala down to Colombia, but after that, the train changes completely. Uh, Latin America is not, South America has not allowed Americans to build and maintain military bases in a consistent fashion. Um, but it is shifting. The pink tide that swept South America is being driven out uh, thanks to the conservative forces the U.S. is aiding and abetting in countries like Brazil, the old money. Ecuador is the strongest state that is anti-American hegemony. So we imagine the world lined up in these two uh, configurations, countries that would like a NATO base in their country and countries that don't want a NATO base in their country or the neighbor country. If you feel in the latter group, you're in a group that does not want total hegemony of the West. If you are in a group that would like to see a new military base open up or NATO base open up in your neighborhood, you're in a group that supports NATO expansion and the NATO alliance. And so uh, parts of Africa, South America, much of Asia is not yet bought into this. Um, but certainly uh, North American Europe are the Western establishment, the Washington consensus by large part. Uh, he implied that the military industrial complex might even conduct a coup if Trump was elected president. If you listen to his speech carefully, it seems clear that if Trump tried to violate too many of the uh, sacred cattle of the military, they might feel inclined to intervene in some fashion. It was quite shocking this hasn't been discussed. And this brings me to a short segue, which is that uh, I believe that for the left progressives to a lot of the libertarians to be able to stand up to the Democratic and Republican parties. We need to have a run green in blue states and run libertarian in red states with some exceptions, some cases run in both. Um, in some perverse analyses, uh, having both the greens and the libertarian in a state might have much more complicated ramifications than you might think. Uh, the Green might pull away, uh, I mean, the Libertarian might uh, pull away enough votes from Trump that the Green Party candidate won. Um, so having Green and Libertarian in both in certain states would work. If you could get the Democrat to place third or fourth, and then the Green or Libertarian to place first, uh, something like that. Uh, so we have to understand it's a two-phased approach. Our common unity is to get rid of uh, corruption, to get rid of uh, the uh, manufacture of an economy with, with, with these very comfortable monopolies that are allocated essentially by the government uh, uh, to about six companies per industry uh, that make massive profits, don't share them particularly well with the workers, uh, and it's sort of an artificial crony economy. So we should both be able to agree to take this thing down. The, where we're not going to agree is that what I'm suggesting is that we Greens commit to later ratifying, allowing people to opt out of certain programs that they can make equivalent arrangements for themselves privately, such people do that now when they go to private school. Of course, they have to pay public taxes for the public school. I'm suggesting that we have some very advanced ways to have the state wither once we've achieved our social goals. It does us no harm if we've largely eradicated uh, wage slavery, if people opt out of a public education system because they've created their own uh, uh, cooperative education structure. So uh, we can, if we can get from the concession of the libertarians, we need to level the playing field and do some mass redistribution in a clever way to get a uh, yeoman citizenry that is strong enough to stand and fight against the central banks. And this is essentially a Jeffersonian plea to the libertarian. 
we have to level the play field. We have to get the 40 acres and a mule to the people so they can go out and do something. We can't leave them with nothing with this expensive cost structure and this rent-seeking economy, which is basically with the money being so cheap from the banks, everybody buys up all the assets and then rents them back out to us. Um, so, so General Allen was very careful in choosing his words. There are certain ways you could nail him for being a neocon that he didn't step into and other ways he did. He clearly was an unabashed, an apologist uh, for neoliberal, neoconservative, American exceptionalist values. Uh, and if we could actually live up to them, that would be maybe something to uh, admire. The, the classical Frank Capra ideal of American democracy and liberty and a beacon for all of the troubled nations of the world. But it's not the world we're living in. We're seeing in Libya a country wiped out with no good follow-up. What the hell has that got to do with the shining beacon of liberty? Do what do you th tell the, the, the mother of a child in uh, Baghdad about your sweeping beacon of liberty or a Palestinian in Gaza or uh, Yemeni under the bombs that we sold Saudi Arabia with your uh, shining beacon of liberty or tell that to Salvador Allende, tell that to Patricia Lumumba in the Congo, the, one of the best black leaders in Africa. Uh, he might have been transformative for that continent. Um, so go, it, it list goes on and on. Where are the successes of this supposed beacon of liberty? So we've expanded NATO, made Russia nervous, pushed it right up to their borders. Uh, Poland has done a, has had a great uh, experience in terms of its economy turnaround. Turkey had a great experience, but these countries are both in very weird autocratic spaces right now, with very right wing forces seizing them. So who knows what's the best way forward? I might rather have a little less economic growth if I don't end up with uh, my whole basis of my country falling apart as a result, which is what's happening in Turkey. And in a way, in Poland, this kind of extreme right tendencies are very disturbing um, and could open up old wounds, in my humble opinion. So this Chinese beacon of liberty overthrows countries all over the world that pose threats to American uh, political and corporate interests, sometimes for good intent, uh, sometimes for ill, very seldom to good effect, at least when it comes to use of military force and CIA overthrows. And these countries are devastated for generations that the U.S. ends up turning its weapons and trainers to into, in, and hops into from potentially like in Syria. It wasn't yet an armed conflict in the beginning. It was the U.S. and its allies, the Gulf states, that rushed in and militarized what was basically mass protests. Mass protesters cannot th overthrow a police state, but they can change it through nonviolent resistance. The decision to go from being a largely nonviolent movement to a violent movement we did not serve Syria. It has utterly destroyed the country. Syria was basically a china shop that Ebola ran through. It was the museum of civilization, and it has been utterly uh, unrecognizable. So what is the frame of reference of General Allen? Are we expected to be children watching someone shower themselves with their Christ-like qualities of virtue? while uh, bathed in the American flag, while in practice they have a dismal record when it comes to these interventions and wars. Uh, and why did we allow, uh, well, I mentioned that to you before. Well, the world is in these two camps now, as I mentioned, a camp that is in support of corporate Western hegemony, Western political and economic hegemony, our corporations and our mass bureauc bureaucracies, the EU, the United States federal government, uh, and all these uh, types of large institutions working together as a general system. Europe and the United States, with Asia a mix of anti-hegemonic uh, anti powers, Russia and China, and split powers like India and zombie states like Pakistan and Afghanistan. Pakistan's intelligence forces have been deeply penetrated by the people who are running the war against Russia's Afghanistan, the Mujahideen, read Islamic extremists, if you like, 
Taliban supporters, uh, people who believe in religious theocratic government of Islam. Uh, so uh, Pakistan is not a stable country yet. Um, it has a deep state operating within it, just as Turkey has a deep state operating within it. And uh, the dangerous aspect of this myth of American exceptionalism that General Allen is proposing is that it is identical to the noble lie of Leo Strauss, the father of uh, William Crystal and neoconservatism. What we saw last night was one side of a global world conflict showing itself fully and unapologetically. You saw the amassed array, uh, symbolically, in those people of the Western military, industrial, security, and diplomatic establishment. If this was the one side to visualize, one could imagine on the other side, the, other, the, uh, the alternate powers, China, Russia, South Africa, India, Turkey, Indonesia, Mexico. Uh, right for the moment, the, the Arab world is uh, ruled by reactionary right-wing conservative monarchies, which aligns perfectly with their policy of aligning with all the most conservative forces in every country. The region is still uh, establishing, uh, struggling to establish viable nation states in Africa, in a sense, in many areas, and a technocratic and managerial class after basically being, uh, you know, colonized. <clears throat> uh, and um, the U.S. is actually heading towards South America demographically, in terms demographically, in terms of inequality and other negative factors. We're uh, we're merging. And uh, my wife is from Chile, and she listened to the George Allen speech, and she said, this is everything I hate about America. And her friend, who's from Chile also, said the same thing, that it was absolutely dreadful what they were hearing from this George Allen guy. It could only be music to the ears of a, uh American who was susceptible to, uh, you know, uh, nationalistic propaganda. So that's my thought on General Allen's speech. My name is Alexander Hagen. Good night. Good luck. Don't believe the hype.